the Lord a hand clap of praise. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord? Let's stand and sing since Jesus came into my heart. Amen. Sing together. Lift your voice. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into talking to the doctor. I, I tell you now, if you're going to have that done, don't talk to the doctor. But he said that doctor kept going further and further and he said, now Mr. Blanton, I'm inside of your heart. He said, look out, you may run into Jesus in there before this day's over with. <laughs> but aren't you glad for the day that God made a change in your life? Let's sing that. Since Jesus came into my heart Like the sea billows rose, Jesus came into my heart. All right, let's talk to our Heavenly Father. Father, we love you today. We thank you for your kindness, your grace, your mercy. This is the day you have made, and help us now to rejoice and be glad in it. Do something great, awesome, unspeakable in our midst today. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory because we ask it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. The choir is going to sing for us. Catherine, good to see you today. We love you. We've been praying for you. And uh, Doug's seat is empty, but the one in heaven is occupied. And we want to continue to pray for her. Just let her know we love you, Catherine. We're praying for you. God is on the throne. And he's the great comforter. Come on, choir, sing for us. Praise the Lord. Who's gone astray for the sinner blind of searching for the child in need of faith for the homeless and forsaken for the hungry and the cold for the prisoner and the captive for the young and for the old there is a remedy
paid for the burdened and frustrated, the discouraged and dismayed, for the mocked and persecuted, for the battered, for the wronged, for the scarred and for the wounded, for the weak and for the strong. There is a remedy for every sin sick soul.
transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved They shake hands with somebody. Welcome them to the house of the Lord. Praise God, children. You can't beat singing about the blood. Hallelujah. Woo!
Let's sing that chorus. Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. I was needing a friend to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Once again. Where could I go? Oh, where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul. Needing a friend to help me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Oh, that saying is for us. Here, body, we go. My daddy used to say, why would you want to go to anybody else? Praise the Lord, you may be seated. We're glad you're here today. Thank you and welcome to this uh, Labor Day weekend. I usually call Memorial Day Labor Day and usually call Labor Day Memorial Day. But whatever day it is, we're glad you're here. And, of course, we won't be having service tonight on Memorial Day, Labor Day, Mama's Day, Father's Day, and Easter. We give you a little break. And so enjoy your family today. Some of you do that every Sunday night anyway because you're not here. But uh, you got an excuse this time. And uh, we'll meet again on Wednesday night. Then on Sunday we're excited about what the Lord is going to do. I'll have Brother Shane make more announcements in just a moment. But you do not want to miss our mission emphasis weekend. And we don't call it. We don't call nothing conference around here. Because if you call something a conference... Nobody comes because they think it's going to be dry and dull. You look at me. There is nothing in this church dry and dull but my preaching. But outside of that, so trust me, that Saturday night we're going to have a meal and it's going to be a great time together. Then we're going to have a dear man of God, Dr. Randy Bell from Chattanooga, Tennessee, a veteran missions man. Uh, bringing a good message to encourage us. We've got Brother Harper. We've got Brother John. Our prison guys are coming. They're going to let some of our guys out of jail, Judy, on good behavior that weekend, and we're excited about that. And I want you to see what the Lord is doing in this little church on top of the hill, reaching the world with the gospel. And then we've got missionaries that will be doing different classes on that Sunday, and we're going to have a wonderful time. You say, well, Brother Joe, suppose the rapture takes place between now and then. Brother Tom and Brother Jerry will be here, me and Shane will be gone. We praise the Lord for that. And we're going to have a wonderful time. And if you're visiting with us today, let's give our visitors a hand. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we're honored you're here. And just let me say this. I appreciate the choir so much this morning. How that blessed your pastor to walk in and they're singing about there is a remedy and his name is Jesus Christ. And then somebody's singing, thank you Jesus for the blood applied. And I know we're living in a modern age, but you hear me today, ladies and gentlemen, without the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no peace with God. And I'm glad there is a fountain filled with blood. And my hope is in the blood. Our ushers are going to come now and receive our tithe and offering. And let me encourage you to be a giver. Uh, our expenses has gone up this summer because of the uh, power bill increase. I think Miss Sheila told me a while ago, counting the power, the water, and the gas, 
We've already spent $10,000 this month just keeping the doors open, and we need you to help us. And if you have never, and I'm talking to our members, if you have never learned the blessing, the wonderful secret of being a tither and a giver, you're missing out on the blessings of the Lord. God said if you would do that, he would open the windows of heaven. And you want God to bless your family. You say, oh, Brother Joe, it's tight and we can't afford to give. Listen to your pastor. You can't afford not to give unto the Lord. God made you and I a promise. Give and it shall be given unto you. And you don't have to worry about your pastor and his wife having an air-conditioned doghouse. You ain't got to worry about that. You don't have to worry about Julie wearing $500 shoes and a golden slipper and a mink coat. And you don't have to worry about my $500 toupee. It's only $200. <laughs> and I may drive like I got a jet, but there is no jet parked out here. And so we're just trying to do what's right. So we need our people to stand with us on a daily, weekly basis with your prayers and support. And we thank you for what you do. How many got a request today? You believe the Lord is able to hear and answer prayer? Brother Daniel, stand there with that beautiful, beautiful granddaughter and lift us up to the Lord in prayer, my brother. We love you, son. Amen, Daniel. God bless you. I feel Jesus in this room. I really do. I really do. Sing that chorus one more time. Come on now. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. You see, happen, and now I know he touched me. He can say amen to that. He touched you. Hallelujah. I'm so glad that he touched me when I was a six-year-old little boy. Praise the Lord. Make sure that we come out. Visitors, thank you so much for coming and being a part one more time of our service this morning. I appreciate you doing uh, making Harvest a place of your worship. And we want you to take just a few moments of the time. I'm going to make a few announcements here. If you take this moment to fill out one of those visitor cards, we'd love for you to be able uh, to have some more information about our church. Uh, but you get in touch with us, and we'd love to return that to us. We have a gift for you. We'd love to be able to give that to you. Push Group is going to be coming up September the 11th. So make sure you come out and you say, Brother Shane, what is Push Group? I say it all the time. It's a church that believes in the power of prayer. And if we will believe in the power of prayer, and I thank God for that, we meet here at 7 o'clock on uh, usually the first, second, Sunday, uh, second Monday of each month. And uh, we have a great time just sharing one another's burdens, praying for one another, and we just go gather around these altars and pray, have a great time. Then lunch of, uh, we'll have a luncheon that's going to be the young at heart. They're going to be having a cookout there in the pavilion on the 23rd of this month. So uh, those of you that like to be a part of that, um, I'm sure that the good, uh, I hope hamburgers and all beef hot dogs, praise God. It's not a hot dog unless it's all beef, praise the Lord. Actually, it's a hot dog. But I'm telling you, 
Uh, I love those. So make sure you come out, be a part of that. On that 5 o'clock, I believe it's going to be on the 23rd. We'll have a great time. Then, of course, Pastor's already hit the mission's emphasis. Make sure that you come out, be a part of that. We're going to have an awesome time. And we want, like Pastor said, we want to share with the church what God is doing here that you don't see behind the scenes a lot of times. And we want to be able to highlight that, see that. Prayer meeting as well for the uh, ladies' prayer band is going to be beginning on the 12th as well at 7 o'clock. Make sure you come out with that. Then, of course, we do have our lasting love marriage class so make sure uh, that it's going to be on the 15th of the month as well at 7 o'clock I know we have a lot of things that's going on around the church but I'm glad our church is doing something I'm glad we're not here just Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night we're doing something for the Lord and there's something for every age group around and we're excited about what God is doing <clears throat> no choir practice this afternoon uh, so make sure that you uh, you can come if you want and sing in the parking lot, praise the Lord. But uh, but no choir practice this evening. I want you to go ahead. Uh, we have a new uh, trio that's here today. And uh, I'm telling you, that's one good man and two women that just broke out of jail. Praise the Lord. But... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Pastor. But no, I'm telling you, I know there'll be a blessing. I thank God. I'm looking forward to the message this morning. You go ahead and you make them welcome this morning. Through the long dark night Out on the open sea By faith alone Through sights unknown And yet his eyes were watching me. And the anchor holds, though my ship is battered. The have seen, but it was in the night, through the storms of my life, well, that's where God proved His great love for me. And the anchor holds, though my ship is battered, the anchor holds, though my sails are torn.
I even held them in my hands that I never knew those dreams would slip right through like they were only grains of sand but the anchor holds though my ship is battered the anchor holds though my sail I face the rage 
raging seas, but the anchor holds in spite of the storm. Now I have fallen on my knees as I face the raging seas, but the Hallelujah. You know what an anchor is, don't you? It's something that keeps you steady when everything around you is unsteady. And I don't think it takes a rocket scientist or a Ph.D. to figure out we're living in unstable times. But I'm glad we have a foundation. We have a rock. I'm glad the Bible is still true. I'm glad Jesus is still Lord. I'm glad the Holy Ghost is still in business. I'm glad the blood's never lost its power. And I'm glad that God is still upon the throne. And I'm glad today that Jesus is still coming. You realize, ladies and gentlemen, that in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet could sound, and we will leave this world of sin and sorrow. I was flying into Atlanta this morning, and, man, I was way above the clouds, and I took a picture of our church and all of this out here from 25,000 feet. It looks a little different up there. And I thought, man, I'm flying in on these clouds to preach to these people, and one day I'm a-flying out of here. And that is one flight. You don't have to go through Hartsville, Atlanta International Airport. And there's no TSA agent to bug me. I told that lady this morning, I said, I don't have one thing on me I ain't had every day this week, same clothes, same shoes, same underwear, the whole thing. But something's always got to go off. But I'm glad one day, praise God, we're leaving out of here. And what a day that is going to be. I want you to turn very quickly this morning to Revelation chapter number 1. We've been preaching for what John saw. And we finally worked our way to this last book of the Bible, the revelation of Jesus Christ. And in this revelation, God, through the Holy Spirit, glory, John saw the bride, God's divine people. He saw the book, God's divine plan. But he saw the beloved, God's divine person. And it is not an accident that it is called the revelation of Jesus Christ. Because beginning in Genesis, all through the Old Testament, we had a glimpse. And the four Gospels in the book of Acts and through the epistles, the glimpse got bigger. But honey, when you come to Revelation 1, the glimpse turns into a gaze. And the, well, glory. And the veil is lifted, and we see the glorified Christ. And by the way, the same glorified Christ that John saw on the Isle of Patmos, we shall see when he comes for you and I in the clouds of glory. And beginning in verse 5 and verse number 6, we've been getting a glimpse of this glorified one, Jesus Christ. We looked at that he is the certified Christ. There's nobody like him because his name is above every name. And there's a five-fold description of him in verse 5 and 6. Jesus Christ, faithful witness, first begotten of the dead, prince of the kings of the earth. And I just want to stop and say, praise God, that's him. And then we looked in verse number 5 that he's the compassionate Christ unto him that loved us. And I'm still trying to get over it three Sundays ago and I preached on how in the world could love a bunch of us as like us. He had to look beyond us, beyond our fault and see our need. But he loved us. 
And then we dealt with that next phrase, the, com the cleansing Christ unto him that loved us and washed us. And how many enjoyed Brother Daniel helping the preacher preach on that one? You're famous all over America. Somebody said today, Brother Joe, who's that scientist that comes to y'all's church? I said, his name is Daniel. And he's the compassionate Christ. He loved us. He's the cleansing Christ. He washed us. And then last week, boy, God dealt with our hearts that he's the converting Christ. He has made us kings and priests. I'm glad as a king there's authority in the body of Christ. And as a priest, there is access to the very throne of God. And at the end of all of this, John uses a great heavenly language, and it's called amen. And I want to say today, ladies and gentlemen, when you're talking about the certified Christ, he deserves an amen. And the compassionate Christ, the cleansing Christ, the converted Christ, he, he deserves an amen. I want you to come now to verse number 7. John sees this resurrected, glorified Christ as the coming Christ. Glory. The one that is coming again. And I'm glad today, ladies and gentlemen, the hope of the believer and the anchor of the soul and the great truth of God God to you and I is that he is the coming Christ. Can I say to you this morning before I read my text, I am not ashamed or embarrassed or even apprehensive to announce to you, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is coming again. I believe the songwriter said it so wonderfully, living he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. And one day, he's coming. Oh, glorious day. What a day that'll be. You say, Brother Joe, I'm of another persuasion, and I don't believe he's coming. Sorry, he's coming back anyhow. You say, well, Brother Joe, a lot of people don't believe in that anymore. It doesn't matter. Christ is coming. And notice how John saw this coming Christ. And if we get through with verse number 7, it'll be a miracle. But if you don't vote me out, the Lord willing, and I don't die or something, we'll come back next week and pick up where we left off. Look in verse number 7. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. Now this tires my nerves up. And they, and they also which pierced him. What? They're going to see him too. And all the kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And when you don't think it can get any better, watch these last three words. Even so, amen. You know what that means in the Greek? Let her rip tater chip. Exactly what that mean? It means an undisputable fact and the ultimate assurance that we have in our soul. That we are not praying, stay your coming. We are not praying, wait a little longer, please Jesus. You know what we're praying and saying? Amen, even so. I believe it means this in Georgia language. Do it now. Come now. And by the way, there is nothing that needs to be fulfilled. There is nothing that needs to happen for him to exercise the charge and come again. 
There is not one sign, there is not one thing that needs to happen to be fulfilled before the rapture of the church. It's the intimate return of Jesus Christ. And I'm glad Jesus is coming. There are four things in verse number seven, and we won't get to all of them, but let me hammer while I'm here. About the coming of the Lord that, that's going to happen in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. I want you to look at the first part of verse number 7, and I call this the certainty of his coming. And may I say it like this today, when it comes to the coming of the Lord, it is not a maybe so or a hope so proposition. Can I remind you today, it's not if he's coming, it is when he is coming. And I believe you see that in the opening lines of verse number 7, the certainty of his coming. Because the first word in verse number 7 that announces and introduces the Lord's coming is that attention-getting word, say it with me, behold. That means stand in amazement. Something big is about to happen. Now before that word behold rolls off of the inspired pen of John the Apostle, he's down by the banks of the Jordan in John 1, 29, and he sees Jesus walking up the bank of the river, and John said, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And I wonder if there's anybody this morning that would agree with me. When it comes to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, taking your place in mind, dying for our sins, would you not agree it is a sight to behold? Then in 1 John chapter number 3, this word rolls off of the pen and heart of John the Apostle again when he says, Behold what manner of love hath the Father bestowed upon us. And how many of agree with me this morning when you see the love of God, it is a sight to behold. Now he comes to the book of the Revelation on the Isle of Patmos, caught up in the Holy Ghost on the Lord's day. And all of a sudden, this attention-getting word rolls off his pen and his tongue. In fact, God liked it so good after this time. He says it 25 more times after this. 26 times in 22 chapters, the writer says, Behold, 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 stand in amazement. Something big is about to happen. Would you agree with me tonight that the Lamb of God that taketh away our sin is a sight to behold? Would you agree with me this morning when it comes to God's love for you and I? It is a sight to behold. But can I just say when it comes to the fact that we have not been forsaken, we have not been forgotten. Oh, that Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth again. It is worthy of a behold. And he says, stand in amazement. A big announcement is about to be made. And he says in the text, behold, he may come. Behold, he might come. Behold, he's going to think about coming. Behold, we hope that he comes. Behold, we, you know, just maybe endure to the end that he just might keep his word. No, he says, behold, he cometh. That's it. Behold, he cometh. I believe that denotes this morning the certainty of his coming. He didn't say he might come, he may come, he's thinking about coming. It is definite, it is assured, it is promised, it is concrete, it is certain. Behold, he cometh. It is not a maybe so or a hope so proposition. Our church is not going to meet the first Sunday in January and have this big vote whether we still believe the Bible and whether we still believe in the blood, whether we still believe in the coming of the Lord. 
We're not going to have no such vote as that because the Bible is still true whether anybody votes on it. Jesus is still the hope of the world whether anybody votes on it. And Jesus is still coming if every Baptist church in Metro Atlanta denies the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's still the King. He's still the Lord. And he is still coming. Because in the Old Testament, there is one main thrust. Somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. We see him in the trees of the Garden of Eden as that lamb that was slain so Adam and Eve could stand in the presence of God in their coats of skin. We see him in that tabernacle on the Day of Atonement. We see him as the brazen serpent in the wilderness. We see him from the ark that floated in the storm to the rainbow that came out on the other side of the storm. He is the song of the psalmist. He is the message of the prophets. He is the anticipation of the Old Testament saints. Somebody's coming. Somebody's coming They're waiting on Shiloh. They're waiting on the star out of Jacob. They're waiting on the servant of Jehovah. They're waiting on the fountain open for sin. They're open for the perfect sacrifice. Oh, but when you leave the book of Malachi and come to the New Testament, oh, ladies and gentlemen, the message changes that somebody's coming. Somebody's coming. It's changed to his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus Christ and he has come and he has lived and he has suffered and he has died but he is risen from the dead and ascended back and he is coming back for round number two ladies and gentlemen appearing in a neighborhood near you real soon is Jesus Christ the son of God the certainty of his coming the scriptures I love this The scriptures affirm it. The Savior announced it. And the saints of God anticipated that Jesus Christ will keep his word. How many believe this morning that he got it right concerning his first coming? His first coming was prophesied when he would be born in the fullness of time. It was prophesied where he would be born, the breadbasket of the world, the little sleepy village of Bethlehem. It even prophesied the way he would be born, conceived of the Holy Spirit in the womb of a virgin. It even prophesied what they would do when he would be born. The saints would adore him and the world would reject him. It was prophesied that he would live and set the captive free. It was prophesied that he would be wounded for our transgressions. It was prophesied that he would make his grave with the wicked. But it was prophesied that God would not leave his soul in hell nor suffer his holy one to see corruption. And if the temple was destroyed and built back and if Jonah found his way out of the belly of the well, then ladies and gentlemen, he would die and he would suffer and he would arise again in power. And ladies and gentlemen, God, God got everything right about his first coming and I just believe today that God's got everything right about his second coming. He's a coming on time. He's a coming in the clouds of glory. I'm here to tell you it's not maybe. It's not hope. It's not bite your fingernails. It's not he may or he may not show up. It is certain. It is concrete. Jesus Christ is coming again. You say, I'm here today and I don't believe he's coming. We read about people like you in 2 Peter chapter number 1 where it said in the last days scoffers would come and say, where is the promise of his coming? So you've just identified who you are. You're not a saint. You are a scoffer. 
But I want to tell you what Simon Peter says. Those scoffers saying, where is the promise of his coming? Will not detour, will not delay, will not defeat the coming of Jesus Christ. One iota. Herod tried to kill him the first time. The world tried to snuff him out the first time. He was despised and rejected of men the first time, but that did not keep him from coming. Every demon in or out of hell could not stop God from sending the emancipator, the redeemer, the savior of the world, and they'll not stop him the second time. They'll not deter him the second time. Jesus Christ is coming. It is certain, just as sure as you're breathing God's air, just as sure as your name is what it is, just as sure as he lived and died and rose again, God will keep his word. Christ is coming. Behold, he cometh. Subject closed. Statement made. The certainty of his coming. I'm watching that clock. It's four minutes to 12. And how many of you can fight them hunger pains back about six more minutes? And let me come to the second point. Not only the certainty of his coming, but the cloud of his coming. I got nervous this morning. If you've flown lately since 9 11, they make an announcement, ladies and gentlemen. Be aware of your surroundings. Do not take bags from someone unknown to you. Only an idiot is going to take a bag from somebody unknown to them. There was a fellow down there today trying to give his mother-in-law away. I said, what? He said, I'm unclaimed baggage. I said, sir, you shouldn't say things like that. But they'll say, ladies and gentlemen, report all suspicious activity. If you see something Say something. If someone around you is acting weird, say something. God help me not to enlarge on that point. Number one, if you show up to fly with clothes on, you stand out. If you show up with all your clothes on and they're pressed and ironed, you stand out. You walk in an airport dressed like this, you really stand out. And I got my little seat and this other fella came in his seat and he had on his Crocs and his flip-flops and his little shorts and his tank top and he said, my, my, don't we look damper today. And I wanted to say, brother, are you talking to me? <laughs> oh. Then he, she comes by and says, do you want a drink? And I said, no, ma'am. And I'm hoping this, he's got to have him one. And so he's having his morning whatever. Number one, I ain't drinking nothing that smells like gas. I ain't drinking of nothing that smells like lighter fluid. Can I get an amen? Would you like a drink? I said, no, ma'am. Right then, Brother Clark, it's Bible getting out time. It's time to fold that little tray and lay your Bible and your iPad up there. And I said, no, ma'am, I'm working on last-minute sermon preparation. Well, they don't even know what a sermon is, much less preparing it. And man, what he didn't know, I've been prepared for weeks, but I was just sanding it a little bit in the airplane. And before I realized it, right there in front of God and, 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 and the dude beside me, I think he was a dude. I'm really not sure I'm hoping he is. He had a deep voice anyway. I caught myself going, amen, hallelujah, glory. Have you ever seen anybody drink gas and look over their glasses at the same time? 
and I think he was okay till I done this, brother, until I done this. Whoop, hallelujah. Son, he tightened his seatbelt. But I couldn't help it. God sat in that little seat with me. When I first bought the ticket, I was way, way in the back. But when you fly as much as I do, every once in a while, they'll bump you up into the business compartment where they sit with their Crocs and their flip-flops and their tank top and their shorts and they drink their lighter fluid. What a blessing. I believe I'd rather be in the back with the rednecks and the pot smokers. Say amen right there. But man, we're flying and all of a sudden we get turbulence. I say, this may be it, brother. We may be going to glory from here. <laughs> Look at them clouds out there. Oh, I'm flying in on them clouds today to preach to my precious family. And one of these days I'll preach my last sermon and I'm not gonna fly into Atlanta on a cloud. I'm flying out of Atlanta, Georgia on a cloud. Somebody help me, glory to God. Behold, he cometh, notice the second thing. Behold, he cometh with clouds. I see the certainty of his coming, but I see the clouds of his coming. Behold, he cometh with clouds. 1201, I gotta hurry. From Genesis to Revelation, you see the cloud. It is always representative of not just the presence of God, but the promised presence of God. Let's apply the law of first mention. Since our church is shallow, let's apply the law of first mention. The first time you read the word, you know, since I don't teach you nothing and I just scream at you all the time, let's apply the law of first mention. When you read cloud for the very first time in the Bible, Genesis 9, on the other side of the storm, God said, Noah, I'll put my bow in the cloud. That is a promise of my presence. Aaron, when you put the blood on the mercy seat, the Shekinah cloud of God will come. I promise you I'll rest where the blood has been applied and you'll never get lost in this old world if you follow the promised presence and follow my cloud. God said, Elijah, it's gonna rain. And Elijah said, I need a little word. He said, look out over the sea. There riseth the cloud, the sides of a man's hand. I'm gonna keep my word. On the day when Solomon dedicated the temple, the glory of the Lord, the cloud of God came in that temple and they couldn't even go inside because of the promised presence of God. Hey, when Moses went to get the law from the mouth of God, he drew nigh to the thick cloud where God was. Hallelujah, Matthew 17, on the Mount Transfiguration, when Jesus stood before them in his glorified body, hallelujah, like he's gonna stand before us one day, the cloud engulfed him, and he shined like the noonday sun. Oh, but wait a minute, after he went to the cross, and after he swept out the grave, he took his disciples to the Mount of Olives, and a cloud received him out of their sight, and those two heavenly witnesses said you men of Galilee why stand ye gazing into heaven this same Jesus that's taken from you shall come in like manner that means he's coming back just like he went back he went away in a body and he's coming back in a body. He went away in a, with a shout and he's coming back with a shout. He went away physically, literally, and he's coming back physically, literally. They saw him when he went away and they saw him when he comes back. He went... He went back on a cloud and he's coming back. He went back in a cloud and he's coming back on a cloud. Here's what you need to do in the morning when you walk out your door, get in your yard, look up in the sky and say, I wonder if that's taxi cloud number one or taxi cloud number two. Honey, I've heard of taxi cabs, but one of these days we're going out in a taxi cloud. 
In fact, in Revelation 17, when that fifth angel comes on the scene, he is wrapped in the cloud and another rainbow is in his hand. I mean to tell you the promised presence of the Lord. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Not a prophet, not a priest, not a preacher, not a religious leader, not a denominational founder, but the Lord himself, Jesus Christ, the promised presence of God, and we will be in his presence forever. And this may be the cloud that he comes back on and we get to ride the taxi cloud. I would be very, very unscriptural and very, very wrong to ever tell a congregation a date, a time, and a place. Because Jesus said not even the angels know that. And do you think God's going to tell me something he ain't told the angels of God? But I don't need to know when. I don't need to know the time. Because the Bible said in such an hour as you think not. And some of these people today better be glad they don't live in the Old Testament day. Because in the Old Testament day, you made some kind of wild prophecy and it didn't come to pass. They stoned you in the street. And they ain't never going to stone this old boy. Well, they may, but not because I prophesied something false. I don't need to know the date. I don't need to know the month. I don't need to know the day of the month. I don't need to know the year because it's anticipated in my heart that he that will come will come and will not tarry. And even the clouds announce the arrival of the Son of the living God. And this just may be the hour when he steps off of that throne and steps on this glory cloud and double clutches it to a world of sin and sorrow and we hear that voice come up hither and we'll leave this world of sin and sorrow aren't you glad for the certainty of his coming and aren't you glad for the cloud of his coming and I'm just going to lay this and we got to go but I see in verse 7 the confirmation of his coming I about tore my seat up today. I felt so sorry for that fellow. He had to drink more just to calm. I believe I really ate it, his problem. Because the happier I got, the more nervous he got. And what would you do sitting beside of somebody in a suit, the only one on the plane that had on clothes? And he's going, glory to God. Hallelujah. You probably watch me out of the corner. There's people that come to hear me preach watch me like it. But when I saw this, I started crying. And I just said, sir, I'm not sad, I'm happy. And I'm sure he's trying to figure that out too, how you can cry and not be sad and crying. Anybody ever cried, but you wasn't a bit sad, you just blessed. It says in this text, behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. And when I read this, I wept. And they also which purest him shall see him. And according to John 21, and according to Revelation 4 and 5, listen to this, the marks of Calvary are still in the glorified body of Jesus Christ. And it's not scars, it's wounds. He was wounded. John said, I saw him standing on the circle of the earth, the Lamb of God having been slain from the foundation of the world. And if he's coming back just like he went back, right before he went back, Thomas saw him, the print of the nails, and said, my Lord and my God, I believe the marks of the cross are still in the body of the glorified Christ. And when it says every eye, I believe that means sinner and saint alike. 
You say, Brother Joe, why would Jesus Christ still bear the marks of the cross in his body when it comes to a sinner? Because no one can look on his purest body and say, it's your fault that I'm in hell. It's your fault that I've eternally tormented. It is your fault that I miss salvation. No, there's no excuse. No one can lay their finger in the face of the glorified Christ and say, you didn't love me, you didn't die for me. Those marks, those wounds of Calvary are living proof that he loved every man and he tasted death for every man. But I believe those marks are there not only for the sinner to have no excuse, but I believe those marks are still there for the saint of God, the Christian, to have no brags and no boast on how we got there. Nobody is going to parade around heaven going, whoo, I was an awesome Christian, and that's why I'm here. Man, I was a great person, and that's why I'm here. Man, I passed the test. My good outweighed my bad. No, those wounds are there, so you and I will say, I was rotten to the core. But he that loved me washed me and made me, and that's why I'm here. I believe when Jesus ascended into heaven between those two witnesses, those two witnesses saw the marks of Calvary in the body of Jesus, and they said, oh my, it looks like you've been through hell. And he said, well, I have. And in verse 18, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and I've got the key. Do you realize how well off we are this morning? Our great high priest is not only the key, but he is also the door. And one day, ladies and gentlemen, we will leave this world and be with our Savior forever and ever, not because we were good, not because we're religious, but because he died for us. Hallelujah, what a Savior. And John closes out verse 7 with, even so, even so, amen. And all of God's people said, amen. you say you say that every Sunday, I know, because the only time some of you are going to say amen if I don't coach it out of you. But one of these days, I'm not going to have to coach it out of you. Jesus is coming, and the church will say, Amen. Even so, aren't you glad for the certainty of his coming? Aren't you glad for the clouds of his coming? Aren't you glad for the confirmation of his coming? We will see him, and we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Lord, I love you today, and I thank you for this wonderful time that we've had to come apart from the cares of this life and pull our feet under the table of God and be reminded you're coming. Not if, not hope, but concrete, you're coming. And Lord, every time we look at a cloud, may we be reminded that may be the very cloud you'll be upon us. Lord, I pray for people in this room today that's never been saved. They've never trusted the blood. They've never put their faith in God. They're not ready, but they can get ready today. Or there may be someone in this room today that claims to be a Christian, but they would want you to come now because they're not where they need to be. May they make it ready today. And Lord, there's a lot of us in this room this morning realize the only real fix for this world's mess is that wonderful, glorious day when you come in the clouds. Help us, Lord, to get our loved ones in, our friends and our family, 
Help us to be faithful till we hear the trumpet sound. Lord, may we live every day of our life like it's the last day down here and our first day up there. We'll give you glory in Jesus' name. We're going to stand.